have Amy K. Runyon. She writes historical and contemporary fiction that celebrates the spirit of strong women. She lives in Colorado with her amazing husband, kids, cats, and pet dragon. I have questions about the pet dragon. <laughs> and we have Rebel Carter. Carter lives in Colorado and is a historian turned romance author whose work offers a space where love of all shades and expressions are seen, validated, and embraced. Cindy Burkhart Maynard. She is the author of three prize-winning historical fiction novels and co-author of two nonfiction books about the Southwest. Her diverse stories focus on ordinary people living in extraordinary times. Last but not least, my friend Phil Goodstein. He is a Denver native and prolific author. Goodstein has written nearly 30 books on the Mile High City has recently completed a trilogy about Denver Public Schools and is working on a book about the city's historic cemeteries, which I cannot wait for. So please give a warm round of applause to our author panelists. <clears throat> Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and open the floor to questions. And when we get there, um, we have some microphones. Uh, let's see, we have microphones on, we'll have microphone runners in the aisles. So if you have a question, you just raise your hand, the microphones will come to you. Um, please do use the mics to answer your questions, even if you feel like you have a very projecting voice, um, the folks at home may not necessarily be able to hear you. And this will also be recorded. So we wanna be sure that everybody is able to hear your question. Um, so to get started, I would like to ask each panelist to share what got them interested in writing historical fiction, or in Phil's case, nonfiction. So um, let's start with you, Rebel, and then we'll just come this way, and then we'll open it up for questions. Yeah. Higher? Yeah, I am so sorry. This is my first event ever, so I'm really glad to do it with you. Yeah. But thank you. <laughs> but I also don't know what I'm doing, so great feedback. Thank you. Um, well, I started my historian beginnings from when I was a little kid, but it was more oral history with my family. Um, my family has a very, we're fifth generation um, Texans, so there's a lot of history there. Um, definitely in the West as well. But I started studying American history, got my master's from the University of Alabama. And it was in doing my thesis of reading journals from women, um, a lot of court accounts that I started wanting to write something a little bit happier. So I, I love a happily, happily ever after. Um, so that's why I gravitated toward romance and creating um, the way that I wish the world had been for my ancestors and giving that to them through fiction, so. Well, I think I ended up in historical fiction the way a lot of people do, which is because that's what I gravitated to as a reader. Um, I remember I was a big Sweet Valley High reader in middle school, and they had a, a historical one where it went through all the generations of the family. And I loved it. Like, the others were just okay, but I loved that. And then I had an uncle suggest when I had a break to actually read something in when I was in college, I said, what should I read? I love anything set in the historical era. And he said, oh, you like historical fiction. Read Pillars of the Earth by Ken Follett. And that doorstop of a book opened up a universe. And then uh, when I was in graduate school, I was taking a class on Canadian uh, civilization um, because I was working on a master's in French. And I was also taking a creative writing class just for funsies. And the professor started talking about the women that Louis XIV sent over as mail order brides in the 1660s to help populate the Canadian colonies. And of course, when you're in a creative writing class, you're always in, a, in the hunt for new ideas. And I said, there's my idea, I'm gonna write it. And everybody's comment was, this reads like the first chapter of a novel, not like a short story, which is what it was supposed to be. And it sat in a drawer for 10 years and then I finished it um, about 10 years after that and it became a book. So yeah, that's how I became an author. There you go. Hi there. Um, well, this started really because of my uncle. He did a genealogy. There's always one in the family that does a genealogy. And it turns out that my great-great-grandmother had three sons, one of whom died in infancy. But the other two 
grew up, they were the immigrant generation, they came to this country, and she was never married, never married. So I thought, well, that's very unusual. They were Catholic, conservative, in the Black Forest area of southwestern Germany, what is now Germany, and um, that would not have normally been tolerated. So I thought, well, there's a story there. I wonder what her story is. So that was my first book, um, was a purported diary of my great-great-grandmother. And then after that, that was um, the early part of the 18th century, no, 19th century, and um, after that I just got stuck in the 13th century and that's where I am now. <laughs> Sheer frustration. That is how I became a Denver author. I have a PhD in useless information. And when I was working on my dissertation about the theory of the general strike in European social democracy from the French Revolution to World War I, I was delving into all sorts of arcane, interesting materials but once I got my doctorate, nobody was interested in any of my areas of expertise. <laughs> Meanwhile, I found myself frustrated with Denver. Why are things so crazy, so awkward, so unworkable, so provincial, so pretend cosmopolitan out here itself? And I started delving into that, and originally as a journalist, I found I could actually get paid for writing about those things. Before that, I used to write for various journals where often I had to pay them to take my materials because the budgets were so low that if the contributors didn't pay something, the publication would never come out along the way. Well, amidst all of this, I also rapidly found that there is a massive void in the area and its writing. A lot of the writings about Denver are amazingly corrupt. They are subsidized along the way. The juicy stories are taken out, out of that. And since nobody else was saying these things, I figured that was my responsibility to go and do that. And they've tried to range over the years from various topics of just the nuts and bolts to the seemingly exotic. My best-selling book is something called The Ghosts of Denver, Capitol Hill. And the book is actually really about the city's most historic, distinguished area around the capital, its people, its places, its politics, its traditions. And probably the best title for it could have been Capitol Hill, the Urban Sociology of a Historic Denver Neighborhood. <laughs> and guess how well that would have sold if I hadn't <laughs> gone and put in a coding about the ghost lore of the area. So I've tried to mix over the years sort of the seemingly exotic with the practical, with some of the juicy things that otherwise disappear and are great fodder for my fellow novelists up here to really tell the story of the area. <laughs> All right, I'm sure that generated some questions. So <laughs> let's, uh, let's see some hands of anyone who might have questions in the audience and we'll get a microphone over to you. Don't be shy. There we go, One in, way in the back. Way in the back, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, how many hours a day do each of you spend writing? <laughs> yeah, okay. jump on in. Start at the other end last time. Um, that's a tricky question because it depends on what you count as writing. Um, when you're writing historical fiction, you're mostly you've got your nose in somebody else's book, or at least a lot of the time you have. Um, because you're researching, you need to know what you're talking about. You can't just be making stuff up. So, um, so I, I set aside two hours each evening to um, do nothing, lock the door, put in the ear 
plugs um, and just do nothing but writing. And then in addition to that, there's a whole lot of what I call writing-related activities. Um, writing-related activities can take um, 10 minutes on a day or it can take three days. So, um, but in general, I'd say I'm doing this about half time, maybe 20 hours a week or so. Um, well, writing is my main gig. It's how I feed my children. So I spend a solid eight to 10 hours a day. Um, that's not always drafting new words, of course. Um, you, there's you know more mundane tasks like copy edits um, and first pass pages where you, it's the last time you get to read the book. It's funny, I, I always call them last pass pages because it's the last time you ever get to touch the book before it becomes public, you know, public fodder for you guys. Um, but of course, there's also, um, at, when you are dealing with a traditional publisher, there's a lot of marketing and um, various other elements to the job. But um, on any given day, including the weekends, it's anywhere from about six to 10 hours a day working on either drafting new words, editing, or marketing various things, or traveling to come see you lovely folks. Um, so it's definitely a full-time job for me, yeah. I'll go. <laughs> so I am indie published. Um, I was a uh, hybrid before with the publisher and then I kind of made the transition in indie, but it's a lot of marketing to be indie strictly. Um, I'm always on TikTok. So there's at least two hours of that a day. So if, you've, if you're on book talk, please find me. Um, but as far as writing, um, I'm very prolific. I've started writing, I think publishing in the last three years and I have over 30 books. Um, I have a secret pen name no one knows about that I released five books on last year. Um, I do that by churning out three to 10,000 words a day. I can do that in two hours. So I also have hyperfixation because I have ADHD and dyslexia, so like we're in it. Um, but usually when I do that, I do it in 10 minute word sprints and it's at night when no one can bother me. So I used to be a bartender, as I was telling them. I'd come home from bartending, sit down at about one. No one's awake, I'm awake. We're gonna write till three or four. I don't have to wake up to go to work till two, so it would work. Um, now I don't have to do that anymore, so it is weird writing in the daytime. I'm not writing as much now, so I think maybe I need to go back to that other schedule, but um, yeah, in terms of writing hours, I guess that's like, so someone else that can do math three times, 21 hours, um, when I'm on my game to do probably a book within three weeks, so. There is an interaction between writing, talking, doing. Among the things besides being a writer, I am a tour guide. And if you pick up copies of my books, they land up saying that I am qualified to go and write this book because I have given tours of the areas that the book covers. Then when I give the tours, I say, you know I am qualified to go and give this tour because there is a good book on the subject that I have relied on extensively on that. So again, it's that interaction that is part of it. But if you want to be a writer, the keynote is don't talk about being a writer. Don't think about being a writer. You have to get down there and start writing. Sometimes it's not going to flow. Sometimes you write it. Let it put aside for a few days. Come back. You'll see why it wasn't flowing and how to make it flow. Otherwise, you can go and go to the libraries, buy the books, and support authors that way. Yeah, there's a lot to be said for rear end in the seat and putting the words on a page, even if you know they're garbage. It's, you can always edit those later, but you can't edit a blank page. That's definitely true. Thank you so much. So, okay, another question. Another one, oh, another one going to the back. Hi there, my question is about research. Where does research end and writing begin. So how much time do you actually spend on the research as, and then when do you feel like you're done with the research so that you can actually write? Let's, you are I, never done with the research. <laughs> Among the worst things that can happen, especially in terms of nonfiction, is you think you know the topic, 
you write on the topic, you publish on the topic, and whoops, you find something else out there. In my case, it's an interactive process. I think I know something. If you really want to know whether you know something or don't know something, try putting it down and print out of that. And in the process, it's going to raise questions for you, which is showing you that you are going to need a lot more research that ideally is going to interact with the other elements of what your approach is. On my case, I get to the saturation point. And there's actually two schools of authors out of this. People that research, that collect, that research, collect, that research, collect, and 30 years later, they know everything about the topic and have never gone and written the book. In my case, I get to the point of saturation. I have done absolutely as much as I can tolerate on this, my eyes are glazing over at anything more, and that is the message. You go on to the next stage of layout, design, and ideally a book follows in four months or so. Did I mention he's written 30 books? <laughs> Cindy, let's go on to you. Okay, <laughs> it depends on what you call research. <laughs> no, um, as, uh, normally what happens is I'll, I have a storyline, I'm in, into a scene, and I realize I don't know enough. I don't know what they used for silverware. I don't know what the p typical imports were. I don't know, you know, all these details of the scene that I'm in. So I have to step back, make sure I'm writing something and not make that makes that is true, and, and not making things up. So I have in a in a day's work, um, I can write two sentences sometimes, because there are so many question marks about, but the period. 13th century is, there's not a lot of really great source material on the 13th century. It's before the Renaissance. Um, and uh, so it's, you know, there's a lot of digging around to make sure you're not um, saying things incorrectly. And I have a developmental editor who helps me with that a whole lot. Uh, but I, um, Sometimes I just end up down the rabbit hole and I don't come out for a couple of days and write something down. But it's not gone to waste. Um, it's all in there and it comes, you know, it, it adds to the basis of what I know about the, the era. Um, but I spend, uh, I spend a, a lot of time doing research, um, but I try really hard to only stick to those things that are relevant to the scene. Yeah, I think Carol touches on a reason why a lot of authors stick with one era. Um, like you have Philippa Gregory who spends her life in the Tudor era because she has become a, an expert on it and it is comfortable headspace. Um, and an opposite problem that I've dealt with, um, whereas there's a dearth of information about the 13th century, there is an embarrassment of wealth or riches about um, World War II, which is where I spent several books in my career. And you've got a lot of armchair historians who know an awful lot about um, World War II or think they do. And so you have to cross your T's and dot your I's to be sure. Um, currently, I'm working on a book um, about Claire Eiffel, who is the oldest daughter of Gustave Eiffel of Eiffel Tower fame. And there's not a lot written about her, but she's fascinating because she became her father's personal assistant at the age of 14 after her mother died. And she took over running the household and raising her four younger siblings and working basically at, uh, you know, at her father's side in various aspects of his business. But there isn't a lot of source material. But I do have to get a lot of the detail about the, the uh, Belle Epoque Paris um, done and done well. Um, so honestly, I get very excited to start writing. There are, um, as Phil said, there are a lot of authors that just are, they, they're like, um, they're, they're, they love hoarding the research and they spend months and months and months researching books, uh, researching the, the material. And I get so excited to start writing and to delve into my characters. I have to slow down and nail things down. So for example, for Mademoiselle Eiffel, I, you know, I made some charts about, you know, very important dates to the family, family trees, um, and doing some a general reading about Gustave. And I went to the um, archives at the Musée d'Orsay, where all the, all the family archives are held. 
or reached out to um, some of the surviving family members and got some information there, but I started writing um, because also I needed a proposal to sell the book to my wonderful editor at William Morrow, um, who's also Kate's wonderful editor, Tessa Woodward. Um, we work with the same uh, editor and the same agent, so we're very fortunate in that respect. Um, but I started writing because um, I had to turn in some chapters and you get excited. But then I've noticed that on days where I feel like I'm really hitting a wall, it's because I don't know enough. So I stop and do more research. Um, and so, you know, I think it's, um, that's a kind of a great key for historical authors. When you hit a wall, it's because you don't know enough. And you take a day off and jump back into the rabbit hole and you find all kinds of cool things about perfumes from 1889, et cetera, and so forth. And um, you can write some fun things. So yeah, that's definitely something I've found to be true. So I'm a little bit luckier with my genre, it's romance. So I have a lot of creative license. Um, although, like you said, the armchair historians, like I have a degree in American history in my time period, that's why I write in it. And I've still been challenged by people who say that's not what happened, but they're operating off a of revisionist history, right? So got to fight them in the footnotes, but I don't feel like it because now I write romance. So I don't have to do that. Um, so I write within um, the Reconstruction era, which is where I spent a lot of time studying. So that's gonna be after the Civil War until about 1886 generally. Um, so my story picks up in 1886. I wanted to play in the aftermath of that. And because I had such a solid, I guess, framework from studying it and my own family and our lived experiences and histories, I'm able to just kind of move forward. I do fact check things um, just to make sure, like I know what Calhoun said in 1850, but like how is that affecting what's going on right now? Or, so we kind of go from there. Um, I don't know. It's, I moved into contemporary, I shouldn't say that, so I don't do a lot of research anymore um, because my historical series is done. But I do have like my library of books, which is a ton, or revisiting those, or articles just like, did that, was that possible? But again, because I operate within romance and fiction, I have a lot more leeway to kind of just move forward as long as I am conscious that I'm not causing harm to marginalized communities and presenting their story in as sensitive and authentic a way as possible to the heart of their lived experience and the joy and love that they went, you know, had because everyone had joy and love, um, then I'm good. So not too much over here anymore, but. There's some to, something to be said for um, researching um, romance as well. Um, I saw, I thought I saw a hand kind of midway. Hi. Yep, right here in the aisle. Hello? Hi. Hi. Um, I was wondering what you think the difference between creative nonfiction and historical fiction is, and if you made the choice to write in um, either genre. I'm sorry, will you, will you repeat the question? A little bit louder. What is the difference between historical fiction <laughs> and nonfiction, and why do you choose which genre? Bingo. <laughs> Did we get that right? Is that correct? Okay, as okay. a professionally <laughs> trained historian, you have to have a documentation of it. Historians that use fabricated dialogue are not historians. They are fiction writers. You can suppose that something happened, but unless you have something in there, ideally court transcripts, documents in that regard, letters, primary sources, you're better off to stick with historic fiction. In my case, I sometimes have the challenge. I have this great, great juicy story about somebody of this, like a prominent developer of lower downtown who just hated the street people, who was at one time a college boxer who went around with a little paddle that he had nail, put nails through there. And if some street person came up to harass him or whatever, he would just whack him on that there, draw the blood from him. But I can't prove that, 
So it's a good story for a historical fiction, but so far I haven't put it in any of my history volumes. <laughs> And I think it's true that historical fiction runs a gamut. You have um, basically creative um, uh, his creative nonfiction, which would be like Eric Larson, um, The Devil in White City, where it is extremely well documented, but certain things like the dialogue may be the only thing that's created, and that's considered creative nonfiction. And it runs, and then you've got um, very serious biographical historical fiction, um, that is extremely well researched, and then all the way down to, you know, um, you know, books that basically just use the history as a window dressing, and it could be it really said in any time and place, but they use a few fun historical details, and it's great fun to read. So there's, it really does run a big gamut, and I'd, I'd stick myself kind of toward the little bit more serious side, but definitely not as serious as like Eric Larson, for example. Mm -hmm. I like creating my own characters. So we'll go Cindy and then and then Rebel to answer this question. So I think I can best answer that question by talking about what I do when I get started with this story. Um, so my first um, my first book was um, regarding my great great grandmother, and she lived in let's call it interesting times. So the first thing I did was do a historical outline of during her lifetime, what were the major historical events that occurred. And I know where she lived and, um, and family lore about her. And so I, I figured out um, how old she was during each of these events. And how and then I would ask myself, how would this event have affected a person like her at that time period. So she, in, a, in a sense, I'm just set, I'm setting a character in, in, a, in a, just in a time period, but the historic um, timeline comes first, and then the story of this woman who I know a fair amount about gets um, defined, what happens to her gets, is influenced by the historic events. I'm not sure how, what, what do you call that? But that's how I do it, so. And I apologize if I'm, I'm trying to wrap my head around the, con I think I misheard. I also have an auditory processing thing. So I was like creative historical fiction versus nonfiction. Was that the question? I just want to make sure I'm getting that right. Creative nonfiction versus historical fiction. Thank you so much. I heard the creative and I got stuck there. Um, so I think with that would be the story. Like what, what are you trying to do with it? Am I trying to convince you of something or entertain you, or am I trying to document you know, events as we know them best to have occurred, and what side am I looking at? So I would probably consider those um, when looking at creative historical, home oh, getting tripped up again, <laughs> creative nonfiction and historical fiction. Um, so I don't, one wants to tell you a story and entertain you purely for fiction, <laughs> um, obviously. But I think I wanted to go back to, I got also into what Phil was saying about sources with looking at creative, you know, nonfiction is, I think we when you look at that, you also have to be careful what you're considering as valid sources um, because that's a very privileged thing. Not a lot of people were able to get court cases or depositions or get in the newspaper. So um, when you look at that, I would always include oral histories you need to look at what the community will tell you happened there and you need to listen to them because that's their history. So that's just one thing that popped up that I wanted to just kind of bring to light when we consider creative nonfiction and like what are valid sources. Thank you, Rebel. All right, we have a, another question. We have some over here. Hi, um, assuming that uh, writing a book um, you want to also sell those books. Are you individually tracking the sales? And if you are, are you ever disappointed when a book that you just absolutely loved writing or whatever is not selling as well as you'd hoped? Let's start with you again, Rebel. Yeah, I was like, I can probably speak to this pretty well because I'm the indie person here. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I do, I track all my sales. I have to do keep on all of that for marketing, I have to make a shift and a pivot. And yes, I have been extremely disappointed when a book that I put my heart into, like um, the historian Nell Irving Painter calls uh, like one of her favorite books, Setting at Armageddon, uh, her ugly book, Baby. 
and nobody wanted it. Nobody wanted to read it, but she was like, you know what? I love you, and that's okay. You're my ugly book, baby. So when I put some of my whole heart into it, I'm like, that's my ugly book, baby, and I love you. But um, looking at that, it shows me, I try to look at things in contrast of, if this didn't do well, then the market's probably be somewhere else. So I need to look at what does well and focus there, because I do primarily make my living off of selling books. Um, so I try to look at even a disappointing book release or a year of sales as a way to grow. And I really feel like that's helped me stay positive, stay motivated, and to make the growth. Because I mean, I don't know. Okay, 2020, I was here as an attendee and I thought, one day I'm going to be up on an author panel and here I am. So, in two I know. So like, <laughs> Thank you. so that is what I've used to get here. <laughs> Well, um, you know, I've worked with three different publishers. Well, four, I guess, but though I haven't released a book with the fourth one yet. Um, and it is a business. And that's, you know, the day you turn in the book, it stops being your beautiful artistic baby and it becomes a product that you have to sell. And that's a harsh reality to get used to. You know, one of my books, um, you know, when I was working with Lake Union, which was my second publisher, um, they were great to work with and they really pushed my first and third book with some of their their best marketing stuff, and it was great. The third, my second book with them, Girls on the Line, that had to do with um, the American switchboard operators in World War One. Um, it was, you know, that was just a book that I adored writing. The characters leapt off the page for me. The research came together. I got to meet the uh, the gentleman who won the case that got the women recognized as veterans in 1979 when there was only 28 out of like 300 women still alive after World War I. Um, it was just the book where the universe came to me and I loved it. And it, it, sales wise, it was the most disappointing of the three. And it wasn't, and it was actually got the best, it was a historical novel society editor's choice. It got some of the best critical acclaim. It's probably my highest rated book. Um, if, you, if you judge based on numer number of reviews, um, my highest rated book to date. And it didn't sell maybe, you know, I don't know, half as much as the others. Um, and so it was kind of, I mean, it was not terrible, but it is kind of heartbreaking that people didn't discover Ruby's story in the same numbers. But it's funny is that right now, and as a backlist, it's out selling my other two LU titles by a small margin because not as many people have read it. Um, so, you know, it, 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 books rarely die. They don't go out of print like they used to because there's always ebooks and audiobooks. Um, so they still sell, which is very um, gratifying. Um, but yeah, that was one of those things where I, that was probably um, in my book coming out at Bakery in Paris is probably that is tied with the girls on the line. I love that book, but um, it didn't quite meet their sales, you know, the sales hopes. Um, so that's just, you know, it's part of the big, the gig and gr there, the, tr the sad truth is that some great books don't sell all that well sometimes. And it doesn't have anything to do with the book. Sometimes it's just the market or marketing. And it's in, in the case of big publishers. Yeah. Or sometimes it's a big pandemic. <laughs> Cindy. <laughs> okay. Then what happens, <laughs> what happens is you take off your author hat and you put on your business lady hat and, um, and become a marketer. Whether you publish independently um, with a hybrid publisher or a full ride Harper Collins a publisher, they will still require you to put in time marketing your book. So I've, been, I've spent a, a lot of time uh, doing research <laughs> about the best way to launch, the best way to market, the best way to follow up, the best way to write ads on Amazon, the best way to do this and all kinds of other things. And um, as she said, it's a crapshoot. You just don't know what's going to sell when or why. They say you've got to track the market, you've got to write to market. Well, I don't write to market. I write to what I want to write. Um, and But I just keep trying. You know, I keep going, and as she said, sometimes the previous book sells better or be, or gets a little uh, spike up in sales because of what you're doing now. That happens kind of often, I think. So I hope that's an answer. The question is, who is an author? Is he a prostitute? <laughs> many, many are of that. 
instead of having something independent to say, something to contribute, something worthwhile, all they want to be is an echo or use their skills to deliver as a publisher or a bookstore or an anonymous market supposedly wants them to. Unfortunately, this is often the case among some of the best-selling super authors around. James Patterson, for example, the question is, has he ever written a second novel? <laughs> or are all of his novels basically the same novel over and over again with simply slight variations within them? And if the author doesn't have the integrity to go out and say, this may not be a popular book, but it is something that needs to be written, something that needs to be said, he can go out and follow in the footsteps of James Patterson. <laughs> All right, so we have one question right over here in the mid middle the microphone. of the section. Oh, sorry, sorry. I'm seeing so many hands and so many, and I'm reading, I'm wearing my reading glasses. That does not help. Uh, okay, sorry, you got overruled by a louder group over here. I mean, I do have a microphone, so that does help with the loud. My question was, in your research, was there anything that you found that was so interesting and you couldn't put it in, and it's something that you want to share with people who are like, I read this in a journal, or I came across this, and it just didn't fit the story, and you always were like, this was so fascinating, or I wish I could have found a way to share it with people, and now it's kind of a cocktail conversation piece. Well, sometimes the best way to do it is to change the text to put it in the story out of it itself on there. Among the most juicy subjects I once came across was on the book I was writing about the Ku Klux Klan in Denver. And among the key players in the Ku Klux Klan is Denver Mayor Ben Stapleton. And he has this on and off relationship with the Grand Dragon, i.e. the Chief Hondo of the Ku Klux Klan, John Galen Locke. And lo and behold, as I'm going through the research, I see the baptism ceremony of Ben Stapleton's only son, Ben Jr., where the godfather is listed, John Galen Locke, prior to the Klan. So, of course, the text gets changed to reflect that. Well, it's true. Um, you know, we, we can't write, uh, not all books. Well, for me, working with a traditional publisher in the contract, it sta stipulates a, a work of fiction up to 100,000 words or what have you. And of course, there's wiggle room. Um, I've never had a publisher that said, no, you must stop at 999,000 words or we will cut you off. Um, but there is cost associated with printing and editing, et cetera, and so forth. So not every detail can make it in, but that's where, um, you know, the marketing comes in. That makes for great social media posts or blog posts or things of that nature and for further reading. And people love it. Um, you know, almost daily lately, as I'm working on Mademoiselle Eiffel, I'm putting little snippets about, um, the, you know, color photos that I found of the family in 1908. Um, about the perfume that Claire wore, which was Jiki, which was the uh, first mass produced um, perfume that was released the same year the Eiffel Tower opened to the public. All those little things that are just too much to, to uh, toss into the book um, that are great fun, but you end up you know, just using them for other purposes um, to help add to the flavor of the book. That was a great question. So thank you for asking it. Um, I think the most affecting thing that I've ever found in the records, and this will never go in a book, um, I also really don't tell people about it either, it's very personal. Um, so when I was doing my research at University of Alabama, I went there specifically looking for what I found, which was like really weird, because when you're a historian, that doesn't happen a lot. Like you're like, I'm gonna go find this thing, and you just don't, and it's frustrating. But um, I was in the archives there that I specifically went to go look at that were related to the Sea Islands. Um, the reason why I wanted to go look there was that was where a lot of enslaved people 
were sold through, they came through. That's how they got sent down to the south, especially to work down like the rice. Um, and I found the ledger record for my ancestors that came. So that was like really intense. I did like, I went, I tracked it and went and I found, um, I was able to follow them to Texas. And I knew roughly from my family like what had happened in the sequence. Um, but we didn't know the spelling of their names or names, so I found that. Um, and like everybody was like, you did it. And I was like, I did. Um, so that that's never gonna go in a book, obviously. That's very personal to me, but um, that's what I found. Okay, so my third book is was inspired by my walking of the Camino de Santiago 500 miles pilgrimage route across northern Spain. And I l met a whole lot of really interesting people and wonderful stories. One of which was I um, had dinner with five young people all men about, you know, between 35 and 45 or so. And they told me this story that their father was a traveling salesman. And he had women in all these various places. And, and they are all brothers, but they did not know it until the funeral. <laughs> when all the moms showed up and, uh, and the sons showed up and, um, and they, um, the moms, you know, were, were very displeased with each other. But the but the but the boys said, "Wow, this is really interesting. I think what we should do to honor our dirtbag father, <laughs> to is we should get together each year and walk a segment of the Camino, which is how I met them and what they did." I. I, that was such a great story. I had to put it in my book, and my editor said, you know, I really like the book, and it's all very plausible, except this one story. <laughs> but I put it in there anyway, because it was true. <laughs> what a tangled web we weave. Um, okay, big hand over here, right in the middle. Uh, yes, yeah, so if we can get a microphone right there in the center. Have you ever used a ghost writer? And if not, would you consider using one? Uh, I've never used a ghost writer um, because I need the money. Um, <laughs> and uh, ghost writers have this nasty habit of wanting to get paid. So no, I do my own work. Um, and I, it would be great to be famous enough to need one, but I don't foresee that ever being the case. Would I ever be a ghost writer? Maybe. I've never used a ghostwriter and I wouldn't either. Um, I think, well, because I'm indie and there's been a lot of controversy over plagiarism. So you pay a ghostwriter, you don't know where it comes from and that is scary, like other than I have to be in control of the story completely. But just knowing that if I was gonna do that, I was opening myself up to that is like a worse nightmare other than someone telling a story that I didn't like and then putting my name on it, so no. <laughs> Cindy, what about you? No, oh, thank you. <laughs> Bill, I have a feeling I know what your answer is. Well, considering that I've written about ghosts, I'm obviously a ghost writer. <laughs> I feel like we set him up for that. All right, let's uh, maybe get one right. How about right here in the aisle? Um, you talked a little bit about what books you have written and the ones that have made a difference. Could you please tell us what is your favorite book which that you have authored? And then could you also please tell us who your favorite author is and why? That's mean, first of all. Um, well, I'd say my personal favorite book is, again, it's a tie between Girls on the Line, um, which came out in 2018 at the centennial of World, the, uh, the Armistice for World War I, and the one that's coming out August 1st, A Bakery in Paris. Um, it's a dual timeline about the Paris Commune and the, the siege of Paris in 1870 and 1871, and then 1946 and post-war Paris and rebuilding of Paris. Um, I started, uh, I proposed that book or came up with a proposal in early 2020 during lockdown. I just started dating a lovely man who's also a historian. And I was looking for new book ideas and he said, hey, you should write about the Paris Commune. 
And I did a little bit more research to remember or refresh my memory. I said, you're right, Jeremy, I should. And reader, I married him. <laughs> and um, yeah, and being married to a historian as a historical fiction author is r amazing, let me tell you. <laughs> Um, but uh, favorite author? Oh my gosh, that is so mean. I mean, Kate Quinn. I mean, she, I, I've looked up to her from the very beginning of my career. And my fun, I have to tell my Kate Quinn story. So Kate and I were, you know, we were Facebook friends and everything. And I, I aspired to be as cool as Kate. And, uh, you know, my first two books, they were Canadian colonials. And they published with a, a large independent press, Kensington. But they didn't do too well doing coming out of the gate because it's Canadian colonials. And um, I, I got an idea. I was, I was talking to my, I, my then agent. Um, you know, I had a list. I keep an idea file of literally ideas, you know, one sentence ideas, like, like stuff I could write about. And I said, Melissa, this is, what, what about World War II Soviet female fighter pilots? She's like, that's your money pitch, Amy. Write that book. The uh, and so I started writing. I had about half a manuscript. And then Kate Quinn, the great Kate Quinn posts, I stayed up way too late last night researching um, female, Russian female fighter pilots last night. There is a cloud of obscenities hanging over Black Forest, Colorado to this day at six in the morning as I'm getting ready to get my kids off to their day. And like, oh, bleep, 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 Kate Quinn is gonna write my book and I am never gonna publish another book again. So in a moment of great lack of professionalism, I messaged Kate on Facebook I said, you can't do this to me. I'm already halfway done writing the book. And she said, Amy, welcome to historical fiction. We'd step on each other's toes all the time. And she told me about how she and Chris Gortner both wrote a book about the Borgias at the same time. And so we came to an entente cordiale. We would not read each other's books until we were out in the world so that we would not be influenced by each other. We made sure our characters didn't have the same names. And, um, you know, we, we, and we'd trade a little bit of research, you know, tidbits back and forth as we were writing. And that's how we became friends. And she wrote The Huntress, and I wrote Daughters of the Night Sky. And they came out about a year apart, I want to say. And they're very different books, but it's funny is that some of the anecdotes are the same about the women using parachutes um, from, the, from the targets and making underwear out of them because the, tar the, the little parachutes for the target markers were not very effective um, and all that great stuff. But, you know, Kate's work is really, I think, what embodies great historical fiction. Um, it, it's compelling and it's wonderful, but it is so well-researched and so true to the, the flavor of the way life would have been that, I mean, it doesn't get any better than Kate. She's amazing. <laughs> I feel like you should have emceed this event. <laughs> that is a really, that is the question that I dreaded most of all, because I don't think I can answer it. I keep a book diary, and I have for a lot of years, and, and so these are the books that I read in eight, nine, 1989 forward, and, and that's my favorite book, is, is all of those years and all of the books I read in all of those years. And if you asked me in a year, what was my favorite book? Well, I could answer that question, but I can't, I don't think I have a favorite book. Isn't that crazy? But I know what I like, and, um, and I do like well-written, um, well-researched, enlightening historical fiction about something I never knew before. Well, I mean, I hear a lot of authors say that that question is like asking, which is your favorite child? Which even if you do have one, you don't want to say it out loud. I think the favorite child question is easier, whichever one's behaving better at the time. Go ahead, Phil. My two favorite books are among the worst books that have been out in terms of sales. One is DIA and Other Scams, the other is In the Shadow of the Klan, When the Ku Klux Klan Ran Denver. In terms of fiction authors, somebody that name pops up is Sinclair Lewis, somebody doing that social realism behind the scenes investigation, trying to tell something that is far, far truer in fiction than you will ever find in nonfiction. I sometimes find that with Balzac as well. 
The problem I have with people like Balzac, a lot of other authors, I sometimes love them, put them aside for a while, go back, try to write something else, and I doubt if anybody will ever read the complete works of Balzac. Suddenly they are bland, they are boring, they are dull, so it depends. Authors are just like those of us on the panels. They have good books, they have bad books, they have good days, they have bad days. So you got to work with them, and you can always write the marginalia in them, telling them what you think about them. Um, let's see. I love this question because you gave me a reason um, to bring up Beverly Jenkins, so thank you. I wanted to try to do that at some point. So my favorite author is Beverly Jenkins. That's easy. Um, she's... Amazing. She is a mother when it comes to historical romance. Like that woman really laid the groundwork and did so much for diversity in publishing. And just, I was addicted to her books when I was in like high school. I snuck a couple. My favorite book of her is probably Indigo. Oh, come on. That if you haven't read it, it's amazing. Um, the neck. But then I have like five other ones I could go on for about seven hundred years. But it's Beverly Jenkins, hands down. Um, definitely influenced me. And my favorite book is the one that she bought of mine and told me. So that was like, <laughs> um, it's my last book in my Gold Sky series, the historical series. Um, it's called Rose and Wicked. That is a love letter to historical romance. It's especially, um, it has the romp feel of a Regency with a, they go in like a trip. So I just put them on a train. I sent them on from New York all the way back to the frontiers. So they come through Denver. Um, he actually has a boxing match here. He's a boxer. It's really great. I'm not, um, but that book was, I think when um, I understood historical romance at the best, I was at the height of my powers. I was like, I've been doing this for two years. I really was able to have fun with it and you can feel it. And the romance in it is really soft and it's exciting and it's vibrant. And to me, that book fell as true to a Beverly Jenkins as I could get. So I was like, yes, this is the one she picked up. So thank you. All right, so we have just five minutes left. So um, if anybody has a uh, quick, like, lightning round question right here. Do you ever have a problem coming up with a title for your latest creation? Oh, that, see, I try not to get too attached to titles um, because they almost always change once they hit the sales department. Um, you know, they go through a lot of iterations, my first two books. Um, but there have been girl, the girls on the line I, I insisted on. Um, and I think Mademoiselle Eiffel is going to stick. Um, but the trick is you do want to come up with a nice, catchy working title to kind of entice your editor or your agent, et cetera, you know, where, depending on where you are in your process. But I try not to get too attached because sales has a lot of opinions. They do, unfortunately, sometimes. I have to come up with every single book title, so naming it is the worst part of it. Um, I'm not going to say that I've gone on a random name generator and just started plugging things in, and I'm like, ooh, that sounds nice, and to kind of lean that way, but there's a lot of pressure because then I'm the one who named that. So yes, it's the, I think that's my least favorite, that in a blurb, the first line of my blurb, I'm like, oh, Lord. So yeah, it's really hard. Um. Yes, the titles. The um, it, for me, it's really hard. I come up with a working title, and then I can't get away from it. And I don't necessarily really like that title, but nobody ever has come up with something that I like better. So the best one of my own books that I've written that I liked is called Anastasia's Book of Days. Um, I've I've always thought the title should say something about the book or what's in the book or what the book is about. So that's that tells what the book is about and it's um, pretty, I think. <laughs> so, But uh, it's hard. It's really hard for me to find a title that I like. Well, that's actually something that is a challenge I'm facing right now with a book about the historic cemeteries of Denver. I've had some suggestions for it. Should it be simply Denver's deadbeats? Denver from six feet under. <laughs> Where to go when you are dead in Denver? <laughs> out of it. And sometimes they're fun titles, but they unfortunately don't often equate with good sales. <laughs> <laughs> All 
All right. Thank you all so much. Listening to these... Um, Listening to um, authors always makes me so glad that I sell them and not write them. Um, okay, so big, I know you just gave an applause, but let's give a big round of applause to our panelists for today. We wanna thank you for your time and your inspiration and your stories. Thank you for being here.